Okay, so uh, so uh, we can start one second. Uh, sharing. Okay. Okay. I hope. Do you see? Yeah, we can see that. Yep. My uh, screen right. Um. Uh, um just a minute. So welcome everyone for me to so welcome each of you. And this is the develops meetup session, uh, uh, which uh, uh, organized by Baku uh, Power BI and Modern User Meetup Group. Always I'm beginning uh, showing uh, my attendees uh, one of the beautiful views of my lovely city, city of Vince, Baku. This is a Eurovision a mall, which has been built in 2012, right? Uh, after Azerbaijan has been a became a winner of uh, Eurovision Song Contest in 2011 in Berlin. So when you are in Baku, I strongly recommend you to visit uh, this building, which uh, has been built and located on the beach of Caspian Sea in the city of Baku, right? So um, uh, I would like, uh, as I mentioned, I have uh, hold uh, roughly uh, 11 uh, sessions uh, on my type group. Uh, the latest uh, session was uh, uh, organized by, I mean, uh, the speaker was Kasper Kamenshin uh, from Slovenia. And then uh, I have had uh, Pragyaki Jain as a speaker. Then uh, Marco Russo was uh, one of our speakers and also uh, Ozda Soloil. Uh, Leila Itaiti and uh, Shabnam Watson, Watson and uh, Rahim Sukhirali and others. Uh, today's speaker is Kim Bas from Canada. Uh, I hope uh, Kim Bas will give the necessary information about uh, himself. But what I'd like to say that my acquaintance with Kim Bas uh, was uh, in 2019 when I was attending uh, Slovenia Gilday's event organized by Gashper. This is our photo, and this is the photo of Slovenian uh, exile day spent. So uh, as for our next speakers, uh, I have a busy schedule. Our, my uh, next speaker is Karina Bescher from Brazil, Claudia uh, Bukli from uh, Canada, if I'm not mistaken, and who is training at skills.com. Tim Pragetijin uh, is our uh, one of the next speakers. We have uh, Oakley Turve, Chris Feb, and also Reza Dorani. And if you have any question, of course, uh, you may ask a question uh, during the session. Uh, you may write your question in the chat box. And also at the end, we'll have a network session and you will be able to ask a question. So uh, I would like to uh, thank you for your attendance. I strongly believe that you will enjoy the session. And I believe that we'll see each other on August 20th. Once again, I would like to thank you, Ken, for accepting my offer. I really appreciate it. And the stage is yours. Here you are. So I'm going to uh, pause sharing. All right. So you yeah. Your yeah. All right. I will take over the screen then. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, for having me, Ilgar. Um, I know it's uh, it's been a long time since uh, since we uh, we met back in person. I mean, it seems like last year, but um, but I guess uh, from uh, last year we kind of just try to ignore 2019 or 2020 out of the, get it out of the way. So um, hopefully one day we'll actually be able to do this in person in Baku. That would be uh, that would be awesome. I'm looking forward to that opportunity at some point, but uh, obviously uh, for right now it's not realistic. So at least the good news is we get to do this over the uh, over the internet. So um, so thanks again for having me. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I see some familiar names in the uh, in the chat window. Um, awesome to see you guys here. Uh, one thing I do want to throw out there as we go through and do this uh, this presentation today, actually there's a couple of different things I sort of want to mention. Uh, number one, um, I'm not teaching or not uh, treating this as a teaching slot. I'm teaching or uh, sort of going more at this as a demo slot. That means that I'm not going to explain everything I do necessarily. Um, some things might go a little bit fast, but it's more about the concepts of what we can actually get done uh, in the software here and, and uh, the things that we can do with it. Um, I am more than happy to take questions as we go along. If you just want to fire them into the uh, into the Zoom chat window, um, I will uh, try and watch that uh, as I'm going along and try and uh, address those. And then, of course, we can do questions afterwards uh, as well. 
Uh, I know this is being recorded as well. Uh, if you're interested in grabbing copies of the slides and the example files that I'm using, you can do so. The link is, uh, is on the screen here, so you'll be able to pick that up at any time. And uh, for right now, I'm going to jump right into it because we've got lots of stuff to cover to hopefully keep it within an hour here. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with me, um, this is me. I'm Ken. Uh, I am an FCPA, FCMA, so I'm a fully qualified accountant from Canada. Uh, I run a little website called xlguru.ca that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, we serve up about one and a half million hits of free information a year. Uh, I've got a blog that I unfortunately don't post enough on. I need to get back to uh, getting into the habit there uh, and as well as a free help forum. Uh, I'm one of the founding partners of skillwave.training, which is the place that you should go if you want to learn how to use some of the techniques we're going to see here today. Uh, we talk about Power Query, we talk about Power Pivot, we talk about Power BI, um, we get people uh, into the state where they can build really awesome stuff. Uh, I am a Microsoft MVP. I have been since 2006, uh, so I actually uh, earned my 15-year uh, my disc uh, this year, which is pretty awesome. Got re-awarded in July. Uh, if you're not familiar with this program, uh, this is something that we have to, uh, an award that we have to re-earn every single year uh, based on the community contributions that we actually put out there. Uh, everything that we do in order to get awarded here, we do for free. Meetups like this where we, we talk and show different techniques and stuff like that. So it's a big honor. It gives me a nice opportunity to talk to the people that actually build the software that we're working with here. Uh, I'm also a software developer and an author. Uh, I've written a few books. Uh, this one that you see on the right-hand side is my third book. Uh, you can actually pick this up now at skillwave.training. It is finally out. Uh, it's been way delayed, um, but it is uh, about 380 pages of Power Query awesomeness. We're super proud of this book. Uh, you can pick it up in PDF format at Skillwave right now. It'll be available on Amazon and print copies uh, on November 1st. And well, there might be some place where it's going to be available in print before that, too. Uh, if you sign up for our newsletter, Skill Wave will even tell you about that and where you can find it a little bit earlier. Uh, news should be coming out on that soon. Uh, I've also written an add in for Excel called Monkey Tools. And uh, Monkey Tools is, um, is a, uh, a software that actually allows us to build better models faster in Excel. And I'm actually just going to talk about that really quickly here, because even though the subject of this uh, meetup here is not on Monkey Tools, in order to get through and do everything on a timely fashion, I am going to leverage it in certain places in order to uh, make life a little bit easier and go a little bit quicker. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, the target audience is for people building business intelligence models inside uh, Excel with Power Query and Power Pivot. Uh, or for users who want to audit models received from other, whether they are in Excel or Power BI. So we can actually connect to both of those. Uh, we have a forever free version. We have a pro trial license. We also have a pro license subscription that does cost a little bit of money here. Uh, the big thing that I want you to recognize is that by far the vast majority of the features you're going to see today are actually in the free version. Everything else works in the trial pro license as well. Um, and if you like some of those things and find you lose access to it, then at that point in time, you can, uh, you can always uh, up to the uh, pro license. Full details of Monkey Tools can be found here at xlguru.ca slash monkey tools. All right, let's talk about what we're going to look at today. So uh, when Ilgar uh, actually asked me to come and present, he said, listen, Ken, I really want you to do a sales case. I've seen you do a presentation uh, beforehand uh, where you showed some stuff around uh, with some different sales analysis for a golf course. Would you be able to share that? I said, yeah, sure, why not? So this is a, a version of something that is near and dear to my heart because I lived this world for a long time. And it kind of goes like this. We, we had a head office that would actually uh, call us. I used to work at a golf course. And we would do our budgets up in advance. And then we would go and we'd give them the financial statements after the month had happened. And invariably, we would get the question back that says, hey, how come your sales are down by $37,000 for one month? What the heck is going on? Now, in our world, this was easy. I mean, I worked at a golf course. The number one driver for business in a golf course is the weather. So naturally, our answer is, we'd blame the weather, right? Hey, the weather, it rained, it was terrible, it was cold, it was whatever. And that was pretty much an easy way to answer any question about why sales weren't good. Except that head office got tired of hearing that. So they were like, can you prove that? Like, was well, how do you do it, right? I mean, can you prove that the same issue is actually happening all month long? Because head office was actually in Vancouver where we were on Vancouver Island. So the weather is actually different there. So they're, they're a little bit skeptical. They said, was the weather really bad the whole month that it would cause your sales to be down by $37? You know, for us, this, you know, August was beautiful. So how do you go back and prove this out 
especially when you don't track the data. And this was a real big issue for us because our systems were not set up to actually capture weather data, even though it was the most important thing that drove our business. Um, the other thing that we had was that our data was actually a bit of a mess. It was built on a bunch of different uh, formats that were built to help it make it easy for us to generate things, but not necessarily to report things. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna show you how we actually solved this problem here, where we could go back and actually analyze our sales and prove that the weather actually had a very drastic impact on the sales for this particular month so that we could prove it out to head office and let them know that we weren't just kidding and throwing, you know, throwing a, a standard thing out there. There really was a reason that sales were down and it wasn't because of mismanagement. It was because of the fact that uh, something went wrong in the environment that we actually didn't have control of. So what we're going to do is we're going to move uh, into a demo here. Uh, hopefully, as I say, this is going to go, um, parts of this will go quickly, but hopefully you'll learn some tricks here and how I sort of structure things and, and whatnot. Uh, and if you got questions as we go along here, uh, by all means, bring them up and, uh, and let me know. I would be, uh, be happy to, uh, to try and go and answer some of those along the way. So let's start here. What's the business issue that we're actually looking at? The first thing is, is that our revenue for this particular month, so this is August 2019 that I'm actually playing around with here, our revenue was $837,000. The budget, though, was $875,000 for that particular period. So we were down about $38,000. So the question is, why were we off so much in our revenue? I've got three different pieces of data here that I'm actually working with. I've got a little table here that I'm going to come back to and explain in a bit. I've got a sales transactions table here. So this is an official control T table in Excel that's just basically listing my dates and the actual gross sales on that date. And then over here, I actually have the budget uh, formula that we actually used in order to generate what our budget was actually going to be for this particular month. So this is based on the real world deal that we used to use when I was actually the controller of this place uh, in order to build up what our budget was for a golf course. The most important thing that you need to know is how many tee times are available on a given day. Uh, we have four players that go out in every group of, of tee times and we send them off eight minutes apart. So there's eight minutes from when you tee off until the next person tees off behind you. You got to be out of the way so you don't get hit with a ball. The big deal here, though, is that it's all about how many hours of daylight time we actually have, because where we live, the, the daylight time shifts quite drastically. In the winter months, we actually don't have a lot of daylight, so we don't actually get a, a lot of rounds up. Plus, it's rainier and colder, so people don't want to golf. But in the summer, the sun actually comes up at about five o'clock in the morning and doesn't set until about 10. Uh, or at least it might set around 9.45, but there's still enough daylight to play until 10, 10.30. So at that point in time, we have a lot more leeway to get more rounds out there. So what we do here is we go through and we say, all right, we're going to say our first tee time is 6.30 because nobody wants to get up at 5. Actually, we got to mow the course. That's the big deal there. We need a couple hours to do that. The last tee time is here. <laughs> this gives us 13 available hours at eight-minute tee times. We work out there's about 390 tee times that are available. And then we forecasted by day how many of those particular, um, I've got some background noise and feedback here. Um, Ilgar, would you be able to, uh, to mute the background noise for me? Yeah, awesome. My, uh, there we go. Okay. I'm back. Yeah, I realized that I just had to figure out where my controls were. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, so what we did is on a daily basis, we worked out how many tee times we were. And then we also knew that, um, you know, different days had different yield of that, right? Midweek, people weren't golfing as much. Uh, and on the weekends, that's where our biggest business was. We worked out what our average sales were. And that calculated down to figure out our estimated daily revenue. How many of those things do we actually have? Now, this is great for working out what you have on a daily basis but it's terrible for trying to feed into a pivot table to report on things. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go and try and, and normalize my data and build it up into a format that I can use for reporting. And then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna compare the historical weather for these three months here, August, 2017, 18, and 19, to see what's actually going on and see if there's anything that's, uh, that's actually uh, causing some differences. So the first thing that I wanna do is pull these three tables into Power Query so that I can work on them. In order to grab my range of data here though, I don't want to format as a table because that's going to break some things. So I'm going to go and set this up with a named range. It's actually already got it applied here called RNG budget. 
And what you can see is that if I select that, RNG budget goes and picks up this entire data range. Now, to get this data into Power Query, I could easily go through this and right click on this guy here and get data from Sheet and right click on this guy and get data from Sheet and then you know, grab this one and pull it into Power Query through the from table button. But that takes a lot of time. Each one of those is gonna take me somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute to do that. And I'm far too lazy, I mean efficient to do that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna break out in this particular case here, a monkey tools feature to do this. I want you to be aware that the, everything that I'm doing through this can be done manually. I'm just doing this to save myself some time. Okay, so this is part of my add-in here. And what I'm gonna do is normally this will set up to actually create um, you know, a, a raw data query, a staging query, and, a, and something that loads the data model. But I'm gonna take a little bit more control of this guy here. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and actually say, look, I don't want all that many queries here. So I'm gonna pull from my months table, sales table, and range budget. Uh, this guy here, I don't wanna call it range budget. When I landed into Power Query, I wanna make a query called budget for this one. And this months one, I'm actually gonna rename this. This is gonna be called weather. And as it turns out, this is the only one I want loaded to the data model. I want these two created as connection only. So I'm just gonna uncheck this box. So we've got a little bit of configuration here uh, in order to make this work. I'm now gonna click create. And what you'll see is that um, Power Query is gonna go through now or Monkey Tools will go through and create the Power Queries for us along the way. Now again, each one of these queries would usually take about a minute to get done. Um, including the configuration, all three of these took less than a minute. So nine seconds to actually do the, the creation here. So at this point, nice and fast, I've got my queries all set up, ready to go. Now I can get in and I can actually start manipulating them. So the weather query, I'm gonna come back to and change a little bit later. The sales query is just a flat out query of this particular table. We're gonna do some work with that. But what I need to do right now is I need to take a little bit of a look at budget because my data at this point in my budget table is not in a good fashion in order to drive a pivot table. So I need to clean this up. Now, the only thing I really care about this in, in this whole thing is the header row where I've got the days and this estimated daily revenue. I don't care about the buildup. What I'm after is the actual estimated daily revenue here along the way. So here's how this is gonna work. The first thing I'm gonna do is use rows as headers. The first row is headers. So we're gonna promote that. So we've got budget, column two, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and so forth. I don't actually care about the data in column two or the week total at the end of it. So I'm just gonna delete those. There we go. And now I'm gonna filter down to just my estimated daily revenue row. So we'll go and click on the little filter, uncheck the all, and we'll look for estimated daily revenue and say, okay. So there we go. That's the totals that I'm after by day. And now I need to get it into a nice format that can be pivoted, something that's nice and normalized. So I need estimated daily revenue, Sunday, 34,000. Estimated daily revenue, Monday, 25,000. Super easy to do with Power Query. We just right click on the budget, unpivot other columns and boom, there we are. Our attribute and our value are now set up. So we actually have a column of days and a column of our budget values by day. I'm gonna take this while these two columns are selected. We're gonna right click and we're gonna say, remove other columns because I only really care about these two. And uh, <laughs> Steven says, honestly, I never thought a golf course in Canada could be profitable. Um, I will tell you this is that uh, during COVID, I've actually sort of followed the industry a little bit. And uh, during COVID, um, golf courses have actually been very profitable. But uh, when I used to work at it, we used to joke that if you want to become a millionaire, you need to start as a billionaire and buy a golf course because, yeah, they're, they, they just weren't sometimes. Uh, but it depends on the model that there is. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. So uh, at any rate, um, yeah, an industry near and dear to my heart, I'll tell you. Uh, okay, so at this point now, what I've got is I've now got a nice little table of my budget values by day. Okay, so every day that we have a Sunday, it's going to be 34000 Every day we have a Monday, the budget's 25000 What I'm going to do now is I'm going to change, uh, just do a little organization to keep myself organized here. So I'm going to move this uh, weather group to a new group called data model, because that's where that one is actually loaded. I'm going to move sales and budget here into a new group that I'm going to call uh, raw data. So there we go. So those guys are set up. Now what I need to do is I need to make a new query, which I'm going to call transactions, that actually merges my sales on a daily basis together with my budget. So I can figure out what my daily budget is for every single record of the sales table. Now I've got a couple of challenges along the way here. Number one, the common key between these two things 
Well, there isn't one. I've got day, which is the day name, and over on the sales table here, I've got the day of the um, of the year, so or the actual date. So I need to do a little bit of work here. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to right click on sales. And we're going to choose reference. I'm going to make a new query here. Helps if you double click it before you start renaming it. So we're going to call this transactions, and it will eventually load to the data model. Now I need to make that common key to merge my budgets here, and I can do that because I've got a date column. So I can go to add column, date, day, and we'll add the name of day. So there we go. We've got the name of the day, but unfortunately this is in long form and my budget table is in short form. So I'm going to go back over here again and we'll say transform. We're going to, ex whoops, hang on a second. That didn't work. Let's go back to the transactions table where I'm doing the work. That's better. Uh, so we're going to go transform this and we're going to extract the first three characters out of this thing. And that way we'll have some consistency between these two columns. So now that I've done that, I can go home and I can go to merge queries and I'm going to merge my budget day name against day. And we're going to say, okay. The cool thing about this is that when I look at it now, I can see down at the bottom, this is a Thursday and the budget's 27,631. This one here is a Friday, this one here is a Saturday and so forth. So I can go through and I can pick up the correct budget amount for each one of these individual columns. To do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expand this column. I don't need the day, I've already got it. Actually, I don't really need it anyway. And I'm gonna just bring out budget. I'm also gonna uncheck this original column name as prefix because I really don't need a column called budget.budget. .budget. So here we go, we're gonna say okay. And this is actually one of the things that drives me a little bit crazy about this, uh, this expansion here. If you go back to this step, you'll notice that the column's called budget and the column within this table that we want is called budget. And when you expand that, if those two names are the same, it actually goes and puts a dot one at the end. And this drives me nuts. So I'm just gonna actually change this because it's actually not necessary at all. That saves me the step of having to rename it after the fact. I'm now gonna get rid of the day name because I really don't need that. I'm gonna get that from a calendar table later and we'll set this as a currency. So I've now been able to take a pretty horribly, um, you know, a construction format for my budget and actually get it merged into my sales table in a nice normalized format. That looks pretty good. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say close and load to, and I'm going to load my transactions table so that it actually goes into the data model for use a little bit later as well. Okay, so here we go. There we are. 31 transaction rows loaded. Now, the next thing that I need to do is I need to actually go and work on this weather table because the problem with this one is that right now my weather table is just this and that doesn't actually have any weather. All it's got is some dates in there. As I mentioned before though, the big problem is I don't actually track weather data. But the good news is I actually found someone via a little Google help who does. And it's this little site here, which is really, really useful for Canadians. This is called uh, climate.weather.gc.ca. This is the Environment Canada weather forecast. And the cool thing about it is it's a nice parameterized URL and we can actually fool around with this. So if I go and take a look at this, for example, I'll just throw it in here. And this will actually get you to the closest weather station that they have to the golf course that I used to work at. It is in Nanaimo, British Columbia, which is where I live. And if you actually scroll down here, you'll see that it's got a really cool table here that's got the maximum and the minimum temperature, mean temperature. Uh, we've got total rainfall, snow, because we get lots of that in the winter. Actually, we don't get tons, but we get some. Uh, so this is kind of nice. Now, there is something that's kind of cool about this, though, is that the way that the URL is built, it takes the station ID. That's the weather station for Nanaimo. It takes the month, so that's six. It adds the day. Now, I don't know why this is needed for a table that actually generates everything here. So I'm gonna actually just try and remove that and day equals one, and then we'll hit enter. And guess what? It still works. So that's pretty cool. And then we can go and we can play with this and we can say, okay, well, what does it look like if you go and change it to, I don't know, say, uh, how about August, 2021? So we got to eight and 21. Uh, this month obviously isn't complete, but it's up to, uh, to day 12 here. Okay, it's kind of interesting, but you can see that as we're doing this, it's actually working quite nice. Uh, this was yesterday, it was 34.5 degrees Celsius here, which is way hotter than we like it in BC. Anyway, the nice thing about this is that I can fool around with this URL and I can work with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that to my advantage to go and get the data from 
Environment Canada. So I'm just going to go and copy this URL and I'm going to build a custom function in order to actually reshape my data here. To do that, I'm going to go to Get Data. We're going to go from other sources. Uh, hang on a second. Yep, that's right. And from web. Should probably also call out, by the way, um, this Get Data button is the standard Get Data button from your Power Query tab. It just happens to be living on my Monkey Tools tab for convenience, so I don't have to switch tabs back and forth all the time, just for reference. Uh, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to Advanced here. I'm going to drop in the URL. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to break this URL down. So let me just cut this off of here. I'm going to paste it here. And then I'm going to say, you know what, I didn't need this and day portion. And day equals one. We'll get rid of that. But I'm going to take this, break this down a little bit more, get rid of that 2020, control X, add parts, and there we go. So what I've done now so far is I've basically broken this down into four components. These all get Merge back together, and you can see that in the URL preview down the bottom, it actually puts them back together. Okay, so it just concatenates everything here. The reason why this is important though is because I want to make the month and the year dynamic. And in order to do that, I'm actually going to use what we call a parameter. In order to create a parameter, you can just click on the little ABC here and you can go to new parameter, and that will launch us into the parameters dialog. So here I'm going to create one, I'm going to call it something super sensible like month. I'm going to make it text because the URLs are text, and I'll give it a default value of six. And as soon as I do that, it automatically puts it in here. I'm now going to go create another one for year. So here we go. I'm going to make a new parameter here. You can see month is already on the left hand side. I'm going to make this one again be a text type. We'll set this one up as 2020. We'll say OK. And there we go. It automatically fills it in. Now the URL preview down the bottom does look a little different. Instead of having six and 2020, it actually has curly brace month curly brace and curly brace year curly brace. That just indicates that it's gonna use whatever the value is that's in the parameter when it actually builds this up. So right now I'm gonna go and click okay. Uh, a couple things of note about what's gonna happen right now here, just uh, for, for the effort of full disclosure here. Um, Number one on this is I've already cleared the, the security uh, credentials here. Um, those security credentials, it would pop up and ask you, how do you want to authenticate to the website? And I chose anonymous, okay? We don't actually need to put in any usernames or passwords or anything like that. The second thing is this URL preview here actually came up super, super fast. Uh, that is not the case if you are running with privacy checks in their standard state, which is enabled. I've actually disabled privacy um, checks for this. I want you to be really aware that the only reason that I did that was for speed here because running with privacy disabled is much, much faster than running with privacy enabled. It's usually about 30%. In this case, it feels even faster. Uh, I want you to be aware though, in the completed examples that are actually controlled or, or that have been distributed here, privacy checks are enabled. Everything here will work with privacy there. It just goes a little bit slower. The safer way, because we're working with public data, you should be using privacy checks on this. Um, as I say, I'm just doing it for a demo. And there's nothing here that's super sensitive that I'm leaking out the door. So a uh, cool thing about this, I can see that there is a nice table in here and it is that table of values with all of this cool kind of stuff in here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go now and say transform data. And we're gonna jump into Power Query so that we can actually see the result of a parameterized query that is actually showing up. So here we go. If we take a look at source, you can see that it's pulling from the web. Here is the, uh, the actual path, and it's got the and month and year, which is reading from the month and year parameters here. I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this sample weather transform. There we are. Oh, let me get rid of that last little character. Typing is hard. There we go. So right now, it's just in this state, and that's okay. I'm fine with this. What I want to do is I want to actually turn this into a custom function so that I can apply it to multiple different combinations of month and year. Because we've used parameters, that's super easy to do. We can right click on this and we can choose create function. And at this point, it's gonna pop up and it says, okay, what do you want it called? And I'm gonna say FX weather, that's a great name. It will take all of these components that are being used and stuff them into a single folder called FX weather. That's fantastic. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and use it. So on my weather table that's loaded to the data model, one thing that's gonna be kind of important here is that we need to recognize that the inputs for our function are text. These are whole numbers. 
So I'm going to try and invoke this right now. I'm going to go to add column, invoke custom function. And you're going to get a real good sneak peek right away that when I go and choose FX weather, it doesn't know what to do with this. If I do force it and say, give me a column name and I choose to go with month and give me a column name and I choose to go with year, it will run this. The problem is it comes back with an error because it doesn't like converting the value eight to text. This is, this is not happening. It doesn't do implicit conversion like Excel does. So I'm just going to delete this again and we're going to try this again, see how it looks a little different. When we take these two columns and we right click and we change them so that the data type matches the required input for this function. So both of these are now text, okay? So now I'm gonna redo this. Invoke custom function. I'm gonna go with FX weather. And this is shocking, right? Like right away, it automatically populates these two things. Now, to be fair, it populates from left to right. It's not based on name. So those could end up getting backwards, but it's already identified, hey, these types, they have the, the right data types here. So let's see what actually happens now. We'll click okay. And right away, we get table, not error. And if we preview it, you can see that there is data in each one of these individual things. So that looks pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna expand all of these columns here and take a look at what we have. Now, plainly there's some challenges here because we've got some extra garbage that's actually showing up in this. So rather than clean it up here, I'm gonna go back to my sample weather transform. And inside here, I'm gonna manipulate my data. The first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change my day to be a whole number. And that's gonna trigger some errors further down here because some average and all this other stuff, all these notes, they get, can't be converted to values. So that triggers errors. And that's great though, because these are all summary rows. I don't need them. So I'm gonna go back to home, remove rows, remove errors, and that will get rid of everything that isn't a numeric day. Perfect. Now there's a few columns that I want here. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and, uh, and pick these ones up. Uh, we're gonna go and make a, uh, a new column here called uh, max temp C. Uh, actually, you know what? I think I'm just going to call it max max degree C. That's cool. Uh, we're going to make one called uh, min degree C. So we'll just go and grab that one. We're going to go and grab the mean uh, C. So the average. There we are. And then I'm going to scroll across a little bit more because the other one that I want is this one here, which is uh, is going to be um, you know, let's just go all the way here. Uh, rain ML. Those are the, the key stats that I'm actually interested in here. So with this in place, I'm now gonna go and say, I only want certain columns. So I'm gonna choose columns. And the ones that I'm after, I'm after day, max, min, mean, and rain. And this will allow me to get rid of everything. Basically the choose column button is your, your way of actually picking from a list rather than selecting things and saying, right click, remove other columns. And what you'll see is when you say, okay, uh, it actually records a removed other column step going through that select column. So there we go. The last thing I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna grab all columns here, transform, and detect the data types. And this automatically goes and sets up all the data types. I could override them if I want to, but for right now, it looks pretty good. So now if I go back to weather, we can see that some things are sort of working, except that when I expanded stuff, it's got the old column name, so it can't find them. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna delete this step. I'm going to re-expand all the columns. And now what you can see is that I have a lot less columns. It doesn't spill over the edge. I don't have any of those garbage rows in here. We go up to uh, 31 for August 2017, and then we go into the next one. But we do have an indicator up here on rain. There's a little red mark on the top of the header here that indicates that something's wrong. So I'm going to go and have a little scroll down this column here and take a look and see what I can find. And I can see right here, so this looks like it's on, uh, on August 2018, uh, or sorry, on uh, August 2018, which day is it? It is the 24th. There is something wrong. And the reason being is it actually has this legend TT written into the values area instead of an actual number. Now, what this actually is, I've, I've actually looked at this page to try and figure out what's going on with this. And what actually happens is that there's a hyperlink that gets insta installed in that cell where they actually put a T. And what that indicates is that there was a trace of rain, but it wasn't measurable. So why they put a letter in there and didn't just put in a zero, I don't know, but hey, you know, something to indicate it, right? So I need to fix this because obviously this isn't going to work. This was August 2018 and it was the 24th. So I need to figure out what's going on with that. So I want to look at the sample weather transform, but the problem is that this is working with June 2020. 
So I'm going to need to make some changes here. I'm going to go and change this back. We'll change this one to August, and we'll change this to 2018. And now, when we look at our sample weather transform, it will bring us back the August 2018 data, and we can see the exact error here. Couldn't convert this to number. I can now step through my query backwards to find out where the error was triggered. And here we can see it on the removed other column step right before we set the data type, there is a legend TT. So I'm just gonna insert a new step here. Right click, replace values. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna insert and I'm gonna change legend TT to be a zero. I, if it's a trace array and I don't really care about it, that's not really relevant to me. And there we go. Now it actually goes and looks nice here. So if I hop back over to my weather table, you can see that we no longer have a bad indicator on this. And if we go down and we take a look at August 24th, uh, which is down here, uh, it is actually working correctly with a zero here. So that looks pretty good. So now I can actually finish preparing this table and getting it ready for the data model. And the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna actually set up a nice little column that actually represents the date. So I'm gonna set this up by doing this. I'm gonna go year, hold down my control key and grab month and then grab day. We're gonna go to transform, merge columns. I'm gonna make a new column called date and I'm gonna merge this using a delimiter, custom delimiter of a dash. And when I say okay, it now puts it this way. Now, the reason that I use this format is because my Windows control panel is set up to recognize dates in an ISO format, year, month, day. What that means is that I can now go and select all of the columns here and go to detect data type and it will get this absolutely right. There's no need to change using locales or anything like that. It gets it absolutely right. We got August 1st, we got August 2nd and so forth all the way down. So that is now my weather forecast for the three or historical weather data for the three individual months that we're actually playing with here. So because this is already loaded to the data model, I can now go and say home, close and load. So that's a, a one, of, one of the ways you can actually really quickly build a, a custom function very similar to one of Power Query's awesome transforms where you're combining files, where we actually have the sample weather transform that we can actually check when things go sideways. All we need to do is update the parameters uh, to the correct month and year combination. We can step back into the sample weather transform. We can see what's gone sideways and we can fix it, which is pretty awesome. Love that, uh, that little feature there. Uh, one thing I do want to sort of point out with this uh, this is something that, that really kind of messed me up for a long time with parameters. I kept on wanting to drive these dynamically from things. You don't need to do that because the dynamics are actually coming when you feed those from a column into something. So there's no need to set these up. These are basically just placeholders. Okay, So uh, don't get wound up in trying to make that happen. When you pass things into the function from a column, that's where the dynamics actually come in. Uh, okay, we have two tables in the data model, transactions and weather. These are both fact tables that hold the things that I want to summarize. I now need a dimension to link these two things together. And if we go and we take a look at the data model, there's going to be a fairly obvious dimension that links these two common, or a fairly a commonality, I guess, if you want, between these things. And it's date. We have date here, and we have date in our transactions table. So I need a table of unique dates that I can actually use to link these two tables together inside the Power Pivot data model. In order to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a calendar table. Now I have a recipe for doing this. Uh, we have a Power Query recipe card for it. It is actually contained inside my new book. Uh, I've got it in you know, recorded in courses. You can find it on my blog, it's everywhere. Um, but the thing is, is that I don't really wanna go through all the steps to do this manually. As I say, the free information is out there, you can find it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna automate this process. And this one actually is a pro feature for Monkey Tools. We use something called Calendar Monkey to get this done because Calendar Monkey just makes this super, super easy. Uh, we do all kinds of calendars, 12 months, four, four, five, 13 months. You can use different year ends, whatnot. I'm not gonna go into those complications and weirdness, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna base this on the weather table. You need to pick the start date and end date for your calendar. We roll it out to the beginning and the end of the year so that we have a good calendar table that covers all of these bases. I know that the earliest date that I actually have between any of these tables is going to be based on August 2017, which is here. The latest will be August 2019. My sales transaction doesn't cover all of this. It only covers one month in between. So I'm going to pick them off of my weather table. Not this one, but the created weather or completed weather table that we got with the actual forecast. We're going to base this. The earliest date will be in the date column and so will the latest date. Now I'm going to say next. 
I get to pick, just check the buttons for which things I want. I've already got them pre-selected. Uh, Monkey Tools learns from your behaviors here and, and uh, holds on to those for you. We're gonna say next and it says, hey, would you like to add a relationship? We know that you're basing this on weather, so we're sure you wanna relate it there, but how about transactions? Yep, I wanna do that one too. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click create. And at this point in time, uh, Monkey Tools will go and create the individual um, components that are actually required. So it's gonna create a start date query so you can see what your start date is. It will create an end date query so you can see what your end date is. And then it will create a full blown calendar that actually spans every single day with daily granularity between the start and the end date. Again, all of this can be done manually, but it takes a lot longer to actually do it. So this is already finished. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a quick look here at the calendar. Uh, this is the other thing that's really important to know about Monkey Tools is that even if you use Monkey Tools and you send your model to someone else, they don't need Monkey Tools to read it. Here is the query that got injected with all the steps and everything else all named along the way in order to make this happen. Okay, so I'm just going to move this to the data model folder. Unfortunately, I can't do that for you. Uh, and I'm going to move, uh, well, I'll leave the start date and end date where they are. That's all good. And we'll say close. Okay. So with the calendar in here, let's go take a quick look at what our data model actually looks like. If we go to diagram view, because we check the boxes, the relationships have already been set up inside the Power Pivot data model for you. There's no extra work there that needs to be done. Uh, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna make a couple of changes to things. I always like to change my, uh, my layout. That's just one of those you know, weird things I like to do. Uh, the other thing that I wanna do though, is I wanna make sure that for every relationship here, we hide the foreign key. Um, this is always important because we want people filtering from the bridge table, which is calendar here. Uh, that way they won't get into a, an area where they've used a field here that won't cross filter the other uh, items on the other side. So we'll go right click and hide client tools there. I, I wish I could do this for you. Unfortunately, there's no method inside um, the coding API that we can use to do it. So I keep complaining to Microsoft. They tell me it's great feedback, but don't fix it. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build explicit measures for these guys here. So I'm also going to go and right click and hide all these. I don't like using implicit measures on these. So we'll go and we'll say hide from client tools. Now, one more thing that I need to do. Again, this is something I can't automate. I actually need to set up my sort orders for these guys. So we're going to set up the month short so that it actually sorts based on the month number. So January will always be one and February will always be two and so forth. And then the day sort, sort uh, we will go and sort by the weekday number or day of week. So that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. Actually, it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Now, the data model prep is done. So I'm getting very close to where I can actually go and start analyzing my sales, but I need some measures to do this. Now I could absolutely go through and say from Power Pivot, let's go create a new measure. I could do this, I could store it on the table, I could write my formulas, check and make sure that everything's gonna work. But see, the thing is, is that every one of those, it takes a lot of time. So I'm gonna go again, I'm gonna cheat, I'm gonna use monkey tools to do this here. I'm gonna use the measure monkey and I'm gonna do this one here, the multiple explicit measures so that I can create lots of measures through a user interface driven setup all at once. You can see we identify the linked fact tables, transactions and weather. I'm gonna say next, and it's automatically gonna come back and populate with all of the different columns and the measures that it thinks that I wanna create. I'm gonna rename some of these. I'm gonna call this one budget. Uh, can't call it budget because that's the name of a column. So we'll call it budget dollars. Uh, we'll call this one sales dollars. I'm gonna try and get that so it doesn't have caps on it because that just makes me horrified. Uh, we're gonna go with the currency for the format. That's all good, stored on the transactions table. For my individual components here, I'm going to rename this one to Max C. I'm going to get rid of the degree because I don't have that on my keyboard. Actually, I'm not going to do that because I want to change these first and this is going to overwrite it. I'm going to set these up to be averages, okay, so that I can average multiple years and different things like that as well. Uh, this one here I'll leave as a sum though. So this one's going to be the Max C. This one is going to be the Mean C. This one is going to be the min C. And uh, this one here, I'm going to make it rain, but I can't go with MM because that already exists. So we'll put some parentheses around it. Uh, the other thing that's cool is we can also set the uh, default formats that we want here as well. So yeah, this is taking a little bit of time because I'm creating a whole bunch of them and I'm really customizing them. We try to actually learn from the behaviors that are actually done here. 
But the nice thing is when I'm ready to go, I didn't have to write a single line of DAX here. I can hit create and all the measures are created. They're all done. So now we've got them ready to go so that we can actually start going and doing things. But I need one more. And unfortunately, Monkey Tools doesn't have a facility for this quite yet. I need a new measure that is going to rely on a custom formula. This one is going to be my variance dollars. And it's a very simple formula, which is just equals sales minus budget. We'll make that a currency. I'm going to get rid of the dollar signs. We'll leave it with two decimal places. All right, measures are all done. So now let's go and figure out whether or not weather actually affected our sales. So we're going to start first with a weather pivot. So I'm gonna grab a pivot table against the data model. So we'll drop it right here. And for this one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to my calendar table and I'm gonna pull months short onto uh, rows. And I'm also um, going to, uh, <laughs> uh, a, uh, so, um, Pragati says, uh, love the non-DAX view, um, and, and Ilgar is saying, you should love DAX. I, I gotta say, be, let's be honest, I love DAX. I just love it when my user interface writes it with clicking buttons, kind of like how Power Query writes my M code, and that's, that's sort of what I'm going for here. Uh, it's a great language to know, but if you can make it easier, especially for people who don't actually know DAX very well, I think then we've got a, a real winner on our hands. So, uh, all right, month short, I'm gonna throw my day short under that, so we know the individual days that we actually have here. Uh, I'm going to throw a year across on columns. So here's my framework for my pivot table. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to weather and I'm just going to go and take a look at the millimeter of rain. So there we are. We now have by day in the month and by year, the millimeters of rain that we have. In 27 and, or 2017 and 2018, you can see that we had three millimeters of rain. This is real data. Okay, so just, just to, uh, to be really, really clear. Why this rains on Saturdays more, I don't know. Okay, that's just the way that it is in Nanaimo. That's really unfortunate, right? We'd rather work rain during the week when we're not actually out doing stuff. But here's the interesting thing. 2019, we had 20 millimeters of rain in August. This is typically a really dry month for us. So that tells me right away that something went sideways in this. So the big question though is, did this actually affect our financial results? So let's build another pivot table and let's take a look. So we're gonna go and uh, grab this one here again, another pivot table. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna make this one here. We're gonna go with uh, day short. We'll put that on, uh, on rows to begin with here. And then I'm gonna go and take a look at my transactions. We'll go sales and budgets and variants. And I'm gonna go and throw the rain on here as well. Now, we could look at this this way and we could say, you know, there's some, some things here where we have some, uh, some numbers that are, uh, you know, definitely bigger than zero that are causing some negative variances. The 5.2 millimeters of rain is causing a bigger variance and 17 millimeter causes a huge one. But the question is, is that enough to actually understand? It definitely seems like the more rain we get, the more it actually affects our sales. So let's see if we can dig in just a little bit deeper here though. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add date the actual raw date to the rows here. Uh, I'm gonna flip the layout on this guy here as well. So let's go report layout, we'll show it in tabular view and we'll get rid of the subtotals. And I'm gonna need a timeline here because uh, this thing is showing a little bit too much data. We've got data for uh, 2017 and I don't actually have any, um, any data for, uh, for 2017 in my sales. So I'll just filter this down to 2019, here we go. So we're now looking at our 2019 sales and to make this a little bit more obvious, Let's go back to the home tab, conditional formatting, data bars. We'll use a blue data bar for rain, that seems appropriate. And we'll do it for these guys here. And then we'll take a look at our variance as well. And we'll go with green because green always has a red uh, if it's negative, which is uh, by default, which is good. And there we go. Now we can actually see what's going on when we take a look at, uh, at this uh, particular um, setup here. This to me is actually uh, really interesting and indicative of what actually happens in the golf industry. Because if we take a look at this, the majority of rain came on one day and the biggest hammering of our revenues came on one day. On this Saturday here, we can see 12 millimeters of rain and we were down $25,000 worth of revenue. We can see down here on this Thursday, there was 2.7 millimeters of rain and we're down 13. 
If you add those two things together, I think the total variance was 37,000. I mean, that's pretty much it, give or take some other sort of components here. And the interesting part about this, and I can tell you because, you know, I used to actually work at, uh, at a scenario where we actually had this, was that Saturday is the highest propensity of green fee players. This is the public coming in and shelling out top dollars for their green fees. So we obviously budgeted that Saturdays are the busiest days of the week, and this is where things are actually going to happen. And typically, that is exactly what happens. If it's nice and dry out there, you can see here, we're actually ahead of budget. If we're nice and dry out here, we're ahead of budget. If we're nice and dry, again, ahead of budget. This is always working well. One rainout on a Saturday can actually be, uh, one rainout on a Saturday in August can actually eat up our entire positive profits from January, February, and March combined one day just because there's so many more tee times and such a higher propensity to golf. The other interesting one is actually Thursdays because this is a specific day that has a, an event on. Every Thursday in, in this particular golf course is where they run men's night. It's a specific event that happens. So the rest of the day is generally member play and members don't bring in as much dollar values on a daily basis. So depending on when the rain actually happens, it can have a drastic impact. You can see we had 2.5 millimeters of rain here. We're down $5,000 in sales. So my guess is that this probably happened earlier during the day where this one, the rain started to come when the event was actually happening. And that's why it got hammered as much. So it's just kind of an interesting thing to look at that sales analysis, and compare it against the weather that we actually had. And I think it's fairly, uh, fairly clear to say in this case that we could actually go back and we could prove to our head office that, yeah, you know what? It rained and we, you know, yeah, most of the month was beautiful. But there were three days where we got rain and that killed us. And that's it. And it's just, you know, fascinating to say to actually see those kind of things um, happening when you go. Now, I want to show you a couple of other things that uh, that I played around with here um, as I was uh, as I was sort of, uh, you know, monkeying around with my data and whatnot. Uh, so I'm going to show you another chart. I'm not going to show you how to build this whole thing, but it's just kind of a fascinating thing because I don't know how many of you guys actually follow the weather in Western Canada. Um, but this year has been a very interesting year for us, and we're, we're getting hit by, um, by uh, <laughs> you would, if it was India, you'd pray to the rain gods to stay away on weekends. Let me know if that works. Uh, right now, we're actually in a, in a scenario where we need to pray to the rain gods to come, because we actually have had uh, 45 days with no rain, um, and then we got a trace of rain. So it was really interesting. But uh, I want to show you this. So this is actually using the exact same data. All I did was that I actually went and added a whole bunch of stuff in here for a variety of years for Junes. And, uh, oh, just curious, how did, uh, how did corporate respond to the, uh, to the message? Uh, you know what, they responded fine. Uh, I mean, they weren't happy with it, honestly. Uh, the only problem is, and this is the dangerous part of this, right? Once you prove that the weather affected your sales once, from that point forward, you will be proving how the weather affected your sales for the rest of your life. So, you know, use this for good and don't use it, don't use it at the wrong time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's a reality, right? Once, once you've gone through and you've proved it out, then the next time you got to come up with other excuses because they don't, you know, they look for something different. Anyway, let, let's take a look at Nanaimo's weather here and I'll show you what I pulled together. So same data that we've pulled in. I've just done it for a bigger range and added a couple more measures here. The chart on the left-hand side here is showing um, a, a temperature range chart for the five-year averages from 2016 to 2020 for Nanaimo. So the top of this, uh, of this ribbon is the average high by day. The bottom is the average low, and then the, uh, the dotted line down the middle of the road here is the mean temperature. So this is kind of interesting. This is our normal, all right? This is 2021. Now, I've added a couple of extra things into this. So the red is the high, okay? So obviously, it gets pretty high, and the axis on these two charts is exactly the same. The blue is the low. The dotted orange line is the mean, and then this guy here with the, uh, with the hash dot dot hash dot dot, this is what we actually refer to as the heat warning. So basically the deal is here is that when the low temperature is above this line for the day, that's when Environment Canada issues a heat warning because we need to start checking on people to make sure that they don't die from heat exhaustion. And literally um, we had hundreds of people die here because we just weren't ready for the heat. What gets phenomenally interesting about these two charts is that when you actually take them, if I can select them both here, and when you go and you take them and you say, let's align them together and lay them on top of each other, you can actually see just how drastic the temperature differences ha actually came near the end of June this year. We started really high. I mean, our averages in this case are under 24 degrees for our high. 
and we started off at 30. We had a little bit where we dipped down, you know, lower than, than average. And then starting around the 21st of June, we started climbing. And this is just absolutely crazy. We hit here 40.5 degrees, and that is 0.2 degrees Celsius off of the all-time heat record from Nanaimo from 1945. Um, massive, massive difference here. This is the part that gets really interesting, though. Right here, you can see that the minimum daily temperature or the minimum temperature on this day was 18.5 degrees. That's above the heat warning line. We were under a heat warning from here through here because they knew that even with this one, the two days that actually dipped down, it wasn't enough. So this is crazy, crazy stuff. And we're actually doing the same thing in, in August right now. We've got some crazy heat warnings as well. Uh, the last thing that I want to throw out here um, is, uh, is that... Um, this is cool, and I, I and uh, Jamila, thanks for uh, for the the compliment on the data viz. I worked on this one for quite a while to get this one right, uh, and originally I actually started with this, and I felt there was too much stuff. So to me, it felt better to actually break it down and then uh, and then you know sort of layer them on top afterwards to sort of tell that story. But the other thing that that uh, that was sort of promised in the session title here is that we're looking at Excel with Power Query with Power Pivot and with Power BI, and I haven't shown you anything in Power BI, so. I decided that I would actually take this exact same model. I just went over to Power BI and I imported it. And I added a couple more measures in order to go and tell some stories on, on this thing as well. But this is one of those cool things that we get to play around with. So, some of the stuff that I love about Power BI that we don't actually have in Excel. I can build these charts in Excel, it's not a problem. It just takes me a lot longer. So what I've done here is I'm actually showing the, um, the averages uh, for, this is the average temperature range for 2016 to 2020. Uh, this is a slightly different view because it also includes 2021. I've also added the rainfall in here just so we can sort of see what's uh, what's actually going on in, uh, in this case here. Um, so what I want to show though, what I love with this whole thing here is uh, is that we can actually do, sorry, let me just grab my calendar here. Uh, we can actually take the charts here and very quickly make multiple versions off of this. It's a relatively new feature here. It's a small multiples. Um, if I go and drop this in, I can now actually go and start comparing all of these charts year by year. And I'm not 100% sure what happened in 2016. Apparently, we had a shorter June than we normally did at Environment Canada. Not quite sure why. Seems like we're missing some of the data points. Um, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it gives me uh, it gives me some sort of ideas what's going on. And then I can sort of see what happened in, you know, 2017, 2018. 2020 was a very rainy June by the looks of things. And we actually did have some rain in June of 2021. But with all of these axes being forced to the same thing, you can very much see that while we do get highs in the 30s on occasional timeframes here, this is really unusual coming over the 40 degrees here. And what gets fascinating is when you can actually go and click on these and cross filter and see that the absolute maximum temperature from any of these years is 40.5. And this is the actual day that we actually hit it. I mean, this is hot. This is ridiculous. We, you know, our... Uh, People literally were dying in Canada from from these kind of things. It's horrible, but uh, just awful. It makes me glad I have air conditioning in my house, but uh, which is kind of unusual. Um, you can also see here that the mean, the average temperature throughout the day was 30 degrees, and the minimum for this particular day was 20, well over the 16 degree threshold that uh, that we issued for heat warnings. So it's it's kind of a neat thing to to play around with, and this is one of the things that I actually do love about Power BI, is that I've got the ability to take the exact same stuff. You can see that we've got the same tables we had before. And if I go back into transform data, uh, let me just pull this over because it's opened on, uh, on my other screen. So once it finishes loading, come on, there we go. You can actually see here, these are the exact same queries. There's the parameters that we built up, the start date, the end date with calendar, all of this kind of stuff. It's the exact same data. And that's awesome. I built it in Excel. And when I was done with it, all I had to do was come over to file import and click import on this and just import and copy that data over. It's just, uh, it's just an awesome, uh, awesome little thing to be able to use these two tools uh, better together here. All right, now I feel like I've talked for the entire hour. Uh, I do see, um, see uh, some comments in here. Uh, Celia is offering her rain from Toronto. Um, yeah, that would be uh, fantastic. We would actually love to take that or from some from the UK. I appreciate that as well. Um, you know, it, <laughs> I don't know how that would work, but you know, we'll, we'll take it uh, right now. BC is literally burning up under forest fires. I understand we're not the only ones. I think Turkey's in the same, uh, same kind of situation there as well. It's crazy. Um, Pragati's Power BI is a complete tool in, uh, in, in data visualization and whatnot. Uh, yeah. You know what? Listen, uh, Excel and Power BI are both complete tools. 
And this is the thing that I don't ever want anybody to lose sight of on this. Uh, I see a lot of people that go to Power BI because they want to use Power Query or they want to use the data model. Those exist in Excel today, right? So don't forget about those kind of things. The data visualization stack behind these things, Power BI does some stuff really, really cool and really, really well. Uh, but I got to tell you, I, I don't enjoy the concept of trying to build these two guys and layer them on in Power BI. I find now maybe somebody who's better with visualizations in Power BI won't have a problem with that, but I actually found this really, really easy to do in Excel. So there's, there's benefits of, of both these things. Having said that, while I could build the small mark multiples charts in Excel, that would take a lot of time and effort, copy, paste. And if they're all based on pivot tables, recreate the pivot table every time. Just kind of nasty kind of work to have to do there. So, um, so yeah. Uh, will I be sharing both the Excel and, and PBIX files? Absolutely. Uh, if we go all the way back to the uh, to the link that I actually shared at the very beginning on the on the cover slide for the presentation, which is in the recording, it does include it includes the PDF of the slide deck. Uh, it also includes the uh, the Power BI. Uh, it includes the Excel before file and the after, as well as the supplemental one that actually holds uh, this guy here. So it's all all included in there. Um, just, I should probably uh, just run this out. If you enjoy what we're doing here, uh, I, I'd ask you, please subscribe to my newsletter. We tell you about where all this, uh, where I do training and uh, you get free eBooks and, and you learn about uh, um, a bunch of different stuff that we have, including monkey tools and what we're doing at SkillWave and all that kind of jazz. Uh, you can pick up that link here. Again, it's in the, uh, it's in the, um, in the slide decks, but I'll just go and throw this into the, uh, into the chat as well, just to make it super, super easy for everyone. So uh, there we go. That's that link. Um, and uh, if you're ever looking to connect with me, these are a bunch of the different places where you can find me. I'm at SkillWave, I'm on the Excel Guru forums, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, among others. Uh, there's lots of other places as well. Um, please feel free, any more questions, I'm happy to take them uh, along the way here. Um, Parvis is hand up for question, fire away. Hello there. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm okay, how are you? I'm good, thank you. First of all, thanks a lot for this beautiful presentation. Well You're presented. Yeah, I work in the oil gas industry and I've been uh, using um, Power BI a lot. The yep. question is, if you were to choose the Power BI instead of the Excel and Power Query, how would you create the calendar table? Because I believe that there is no um, multiple to multiple connection in the Power BI, so it's only like one too many or many to one. There is no many too many, right? Uh, well, there is many too many, but I wouldn't use it. Um, I, I, I avoid many too many at all costs. I think it's, uh, I think they're unfortunately very well or not very well uh, understood and, uh, and cause a lot of danger along the way. But uh, the answer as to how I would actually create it, um, let, me, let me just walk you through this process here real quick. So uh, I do it through Power Query. Um, there is a calendar auto feature in DAX. I prefer Power Query for this. Uh, what you'll notice is that this is actually follows a pattern here. I've referenced my original weather table. Uh, I removed everything except for the date column. I've removed the duplicates from it. I filter it down to the earliest date, change it to the beginning of the year, and then basically change it to a date and drill down. This is a recipe pattern I use over and over again. This gives me the earliest date that I have in any of my tables, which, well, this one gives me the earliest date from the weather table. I do the same thing with the end date, except I filter the last date and convert it to the end of the year. The secret for the calendar table at that point basically becomes this. What we do is we say, I would like to create a list. That's what the curly brackets are around here. We convert the start date into a number that gives me a list of numbers from the beginning to the end with every single piece in between, convert it to a table, rename it so that it becomes a date, and then we change it to a date. There is my list of contiguous dates that I have here, and now it's simply add column, whatever format you want. So in this case, we got year, we got months and, and so forth. Uh, this is a recipe pattern that I use all the time for these kind of things. It works absolutely brilliantly. It works in Excel, it works in Power BI because it works in Power Query. So it'll work in anything that actually has Power Query as, a, as an interface that's, uh, that's sort of set up. Um, it is one of the patterns that uh, that we have inside our uh, our recipe cards. So I mean, if you're if you're interested in picking uh, picking up a, a package of recipe cards that actually contains those, as well as a variety of different things, I can give you two different options for that. That are the the cheapest two options. There's other ones out there as well uh, that come with uh, with full on training. But um, it is covered inside uh, inside my uh, my new book, um, which is called Master Your Data. 
uh, which you can find here. Chapter 17 is all about creating calendar tables, all kinds of different ones. There's about 30 pages of information on that. Uh, if you want just a more picture view, um, there is a, a product here, the Power Free Recipe Card subscription uh, or, or standalone. Uh, is a little bit more expensive, but it has a whole bunch more uh, recipe cards. And we actually update this on a quarterly basis with new patterns and recipes as well. So, um, so yeah, so th that's the easiest way. I mean, I would say probably the cheapest way to find the patterns is actually here and you get a ton of other stuff as well. Uh, plus you can find things on the internet for the pattern as well, or it's included in, in monkey tools and you can get at it with a free demo. But the challenge with that is you'd have to build it in Excel and then import it to Power BI, but it will work there. So awesome. hopefully, awesome. hopefully that answers the question. Thanks a lot. Cool. Uh, I see David Pruitt, you've got your hand up as well. Hey, hey, Ken, took me a second to uh, get off mute there. Uh, yeah, great hard, presentation. Hard <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess maybe this is a little bit more of a theoretical question. Um, I, I looked at some information just the other day about businesses in the U.S., and some 98, maybe 99% of all businesses are less than 50 employees. Okay. This and, makes sense. Okay. And so most businesses I'm comfortable saying don't even have a, say a full time IT person yeah. is, is, is pushing businesses um, toward power BI, you know, the smart move or should, should it be more encouraging people to make the most out of Excel? Because I mean, even the even the smallest businesses, you know, you know, one person uh, usually have Excel and use it at some level. Um, but it just, I don't know. It just, I keep having this thought that that you know the the typical, and when I say typical, ninety eight percent of the businesses, I I just don't know that they'll ever get there with Power BI. Yeah, that so maybe they. I'll give you I'll give you my my impression on that, and I think the the challenge with that is that I mean I firmly believe that 98% of businesses are small businesses. Uh, I'll say that. I mean uh, that's the one thing is that that I remember uh, years ago from college is that 98% um, uh, of large businesses start as small businesses. There's very very few that uh, that start off as a big business right off the day off the bat. Uh, one of the things that's challenging with that, though, is what is a small business? Um, I, I believe that businesses under 250 employees are classified as small. To me, that's starting to get towards where you've got the same problems from a, a larger business. Uh, small businesses of less than five people, those are really small, right? So right. The, ans the answer kind of depends, I, I think, a little bit on, on what the scale is of, of what you're trying to accomplish. If you're a, a you know a one to ten person shop or whatnot, I mean typically I would be sticking mostly with Excel most of the time, uh, unless there's a specific need not to. And I mean, you know my business is is uh, is six people big, and we use Power BI for certain things. But honestly, it's really about scheduling the refresh for certain things to make sure that they're done and, and whatnot. Uh, I would say that in a very very small business, uh, you know if you got one person unless you're looking to schedule a refresh on something and have it done automatically, I don't think Power BI is really a requirement for a license. Uh, I would say that you can still download Power BI desktop to do the things that you need to do, um, but ultimately you're really not going to need to share it with anyone or anything like that. So, you know, why would you be getting into a full-blown Power BI ecosystem? Uh, when you're looking at, you know, one to five users, typically people can still share on a relatively easy basis. So doing things in Excel, unless there's a reason to go to Power BI for a different visualization that's too hard to make in Excel, I'd probably lean to sticking to Excel. As things get bigger, where, where I see the real advantages with Power BI is around the control of sharing um, is, is much better in Power BI. In, inside Excel, when you email a file out, it's gone, you've lost control, the chain of custody, you've lost control, you can't protect it, it's, it's out the door, it's, you know, the horse is out of the barn. Power BI has the ability to actually start taking control of that. So as the company gets bigger and the need is out there to share things with, with more people or have more people build answers based on it uh, without redoing work, that's where Power BI starts to become a, a helpful thing. So you know, if you're starting to look around 20, 30, 40, 50 employees, uh, depending on the industry, because everything's always different, that's where I would start seeing Power BI becomes more useful. Typically, what I recommend people do, even when I go into small or into departments inside big business, is learn the Excel side first. Because once you've got the Excel dialed in, 
the tools inside Power Query and Power Pivot can be taken over to Power BI very, very easily. And then it just becomes a matter of, well, what's the benefit? Why would I choose one over the other at, at that point in time? So to me, I'm, I'm very much about a pushing Excel first for analysts um, and then, you know, do the Power BI second. Uh, should somebody actually need to get there? Should there be benefits from the sharing and security aspect or the automated refresh that they, or potentially the ability to do more complicated visuals that Excel doesn't support? Um, those would be reasons that I would actually look at taking someone to Power BI, but they're going to be specific to each client. So hopefully that helps. Yes, yes, very helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Jamila, what uh, what do you got for me? Hello, Ken. Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was really great. Um, I've just got a question. I'm just starting out to understand the Power Query and how it all works. And the fact, um, my background is in accounting and finance. And the example that I use is normally we do on a monthly basis, monthly reporting. So for someone who's myself starting out and the book that you just published, is that for some of the beginner or is it for someone who is actually a professional? So I uh, want something that I can take like a, you know, can I answer, and that's what can you I did and going forward. <laughs> yeah, can I answer <laughs> that, that, that question? Is it for the beginner or is it for the professional? Can I answer yes to both questions? Um, because honestly it is. I mean, that's one of the things that we actually worked really, really hard with when we wrote the book is to, uh, to try and make sure that it was going to be um, accessible to people who have never, or, well, it was going to help people who have never used Power Query get up to speed with how it all works. But we also wanted to make sure that we had enough stuff in there that people who actually do have a lot of experience would learn from the book. Um, you know, it, it's the second edition. The first edition was uh, was called Emmons for Data Monkey. Uh, this one here, we we rewrote. Uh, I think we rewrote all but about three pages in the, in this book um, and expanded it massively. So there's a ton of stuff there. Uh, the other thing that I could suggest to you is if you if you have a background in accounting and finance um, and you're interested in taking courses, uh, check out what we do at Skillwave um, because we we I mean I teach to people like you all the time that are, are coming from a, a world where they have the background and understanding what the data is that they want to interpret, but not necessarily how to actually use the tools to get the best pieces out. Um, I, I run a program called the Self Service BI Bootcamp, which is specifically built to get people up to speed uh, with Power Query, Power Pivot, uh, Power BI, and, and sort of get the best parts of all of that so you can figure out what tools to use and when and learn how to, how to work with Power Query, learn how to work with the DAX formula language and all these kind of things. So there's lots of resources out there. And I mean, you know, I'll say to anybody, uh, whether you learn it from me or learn it from somebody else doesn't really matter. I'd love it if you learned it from me, but if you learn it from someone else, that's cool. Just make sure you learn it. Um, so, you know, as I say, the book's a great start. Uh, if you're if you're interested in, in more of a, a feel where you actually get guided and coached through it, check out my self service BI bootcamp at Skillwave. Um, I think you'd find that uh, super useful as well. So, um, and there's lots of other resources out there. Check out check out what's out there. So, hopefully uh, hopefully that helps a little bit. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, uh, sorry. Can, can I ask a question? Sure, you can. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, is uh, are there um, uh, are there a lot of differences between uh, your uh, new version of uh, and uh, last version of your book? I mean, in data for a uh, monkey. Uh, uh, is there is there a lot of difference between MS for Data Monkey and Master Your Data? Yes. Uh, let me let, let me put it this way. Um, MS for Data Monkey was 220 pages. Master Your Data is 380. And we oh. rewrote every page except for three in the book. Is there a big difference? Oh my God, yes. yes. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, like when I, uh, if I can, if I can just pick off like, you know, specific one chapter that, uh, that, that we had in there um, was on merging data. In, uh, in MS for Data Monkey, merging data was about uh, eight pages. Uh, in Master Your Data, it is 30 because we cover every single join that's there. We cover approximate matching with a, with a revised algorithm. We cover fuzzy matching. None of those things were actually in uh, the original book. Yeah, it, it's been rewritten from cover to cover, expanded massively. Uh, there is so much stuff that we got into that book. Um, and I'm super proud of what's there. It is absolutely, it's a brand new book. I mean, it is totally different. So I would, uh, same core concepts, but but illustrated better, more examples and, and, uh, and starts off with a lot more stuff on structure. So, um, Yes, that's the short answer. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I'm just okay, uh, the... yes. Sorry, one more question, Ken. Which yeah. course did you say for I should look into in your skills way? Uh, here, let me uh, let me let me jump right over there uh, right now. So, uh, on our courses page, if I go to uh, to Skillwave here. 
Uh, the one that uh, the one that I'm talking about is actually this one, the self service BI bootcamp. Uh, this guy here, as I say, um, it actually starts off and uh, and deals with uh, with basic pivot tables. Um, it and then it goes. The whole course overview is here, but we cover Power Query, we cover Power Pivot, we cover DAX, we cover about uh, about Power BI as well. Uh, the full sort of outline of the entire course is here. Uh, this also comes with um, with uh, Q and A, uh, Q or question and answer sessions. Uh, you get six of those. Uh, before I expand it, because there's going to be more coming on this. There's Ask Me Anything sessions once a month uh, for a continued basis where you can actually uh, talk to us and, and get your feedback on different things. There's a ton of stuff in this. It's a huge, huge program. So um, the price looks a little bit steep to begin with, but if you if you actually go in and tear back on this, the the big part is it's uh, it's recordings with a year of access. Uh, it's it's um, com basically free consulting built into it, all kinds of stuff. So so check it out and see. Um, as I say, I know the price seems high at the beginning on it, um, but but definitely take a look at it and see. Uh, I think you find that it, uh, it 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 answers an awful lot of questions and gets you set off on the right foot. So. Um, oh, I got the comment. They love the uh, the monkey software with the Excel T-shirt behind me. Uh, yeah, um, I got my uh, my monkey for uh, for Christmas uh, years ago, and uh, and one of my friends was commenting that he didn't like the fact that the monkey wasn't wearing any clothes. So we put an Excel T-shirt on him to uh, to make him more presentable. Uh, the the history of the um, of the book. Uh, Rajiv, I think you're really overthinking this one. Um, now, the so so the term data monkey uh, has actually been used as a derogatory term to to do to uh, describe some people. Um, I've never been one to shy away from a derogatory term on things and, and try and take it over. I mean, I've been calling myself a geek long since uh, before uh, that was actually a badge of honor. Um, so that's kind of where we went with. We love the term data monkey. Um, originally, when we rent to write M is for data monkey, we just thought it was a really cool title. And then as we started to write the book, we realized that we didn't really want to write a book on M. We really wanted to write a book on how to use Power Query. And, but the, the title was so cool that we kind of stuck with it. So that, that's really kind of what the, the gist is of where that, uh, the history of that, uh, that name came from. Um, now we've moved into uh, the, the challenge with it, even though it was a really cool name though, is that nobody knew to look for a book on Power Query called M is for Data Monkey. So this is why we've actually changed the name to Master Your Data. Uh, but we have kept uh, the fact that it is the second edition formerly known as M is for Data Monkey on the cover as well uh, for people to, uh, to actually look at and, and whatnot as well. Uh, Jamila, you're welcome um, as well. So, uh, so yeah, so that's sort of the, uh, the history there. Um, I see there's a scale up comment on Power BI in the chat as well. Um, I certainly agree that uh, that yes, uh, people should be Excel literate. In, in my opinion, Excel literate first, and then after that, I mean, Power BI does give a good scale up license uh, model as well for sure. Um, my my biggest recommendation on anything with those kind of things is train your people on how to use the actual uh, underlying tools first before you just roll out Power BI to an organization and let them have a free for all. Uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. You want to set your, your governance up properly, but uh, but that's a whole different discussion, I think, as well. So, um, Bragetti, Jay wants to tell you something. Bragetti, Jay. Yes. Yeah, so, sure. so Ken, thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, You're very welcome. Session. I mean, that was really helpful to know a few things which I really didn't know about that work in Excel, because obviously I don't come from Excel background, but my question is more around outside the session. So, mm -hmm. so in this session, Ken, you have really presented a case study, use case, yep. which is like based on a real world data, right? So, yep. so how do you basically come up these kind of things? Like, uh, I mean, just consider me as a mature who, who has just started speaking in, in public. So, so how do you come up with these real world scenarios? Like these could be like a good fit for your session. How do you think about these things? Uh, well, I lived it. I mean, this, this, this was my job for 15 years was, was answering questions from head office. So this is a, like, this is a real world example. Uh, but I mean, having said that, I mean, you know, I've, uh, I, I draw a lot from the history that I have. I mean, I'm an accountant that worked in, in uh, trying to answer questions for, for head office in a lot of cases. Uh, I posted a lot of uh, a lot of question and answer in help forums uh, online, so I saw a lot of people's other data in those scenarios and the the challenges that they were uh, they were trying to uh, to do as well. Um, when I went through and and started uh, showing and and uh, and sharing some of the examples, I was mostly drawing on my history, but. Um, but the interesting thing is, is as I, I mean, I'm a trainer, so I mean, I'll go into uh, into an organization. That's what my my bread and butter is. 
um, is I'll go into an organization and I'll train people on how to do things. And one of my favorite things to do with that is to also add on an extra session, which is an ask me anything session at the end where we actually spend uh, a full day sitting down and actually building things with the client solutions based on the things that we've actually taught. So through that history over the last uh, 15 years or so, um, I mean, I've seen an awful lot of data in a lot of different scenarios and, and whatnot. And it, you, you just you, you pick out the ones that resonate the most that you can do within a certain time frame and, and whatnot. Um, this is this is one of my favorite historical examples because it's one of those ones where I actually got to go back and give somebody an answer that made them happy enough for the, the time being. Although, as I say, we you know we had to to go and actually report on other things later, which uh, became a challenge because then you know suddenly you got a story that you blame the weather and it didn't work and you went shoot now I got to find something else. Um, but it's kind of neat. I mean, this is one of the one of the fun things for me is being able to see a lot of different data scenarios. Uh, if you come to any of the courses that I do, I, I take a lot of pride mm -hmm. that I don't teach with an AdventureWorks database. I teach with near real world data samples, which I, I claim, well, I will tell you, are generally real world data samples that have been cleaned up to protect the innocent and the guilty. And, and we use those to teach because mm -hmm. there's no substitute for for uh, for connection with people than seeing data that actually looks like theirs. And you'd be surprised yeah, how often that happens. So. Yeah, absolutely. I agree on that, Ken. And, and especially when you bring these kind of real world examples, then people can relate as well very easily, especially the audience you're talking to. So, so yeah. Yeah. For so, sure. yeah. So I think it's I think I think it's more about the experience which you have got in your last 15 years that helps you in generating these kind of real world scenarios, right? Yeah. Um, yeah for sure. I mean, it uh, it's that that's definitely the the, the challenge, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, once you got it, I mean, as I say, it's, it's really keeping your eyes open for the things that people bring to you and present to you and, and seeing what you can actually capture and use. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I also, uh, I also see a question from, uh, from Rajiv on how important is it to, uh, to learn the M language. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, what made me fall in love with Excel from day one was actually the VBA language. And I, I, I still today, I love VBA. I don't do very much of it anymore because most of the stuff that I do is in Power Query. Uh, how much time do I spend writing M, like actually busting out a code editor and writing M? Not very much. Um, having said that, it's in my wheelhouse. So if I need to, I can. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the thing that, that I sort of look at. So how important is it? It really depends on what you want to do. I mean, the more you learn, the more powerful you are when you're working with data. Um, the, you know, if I, I like to tell people with Power Query, though, one of the really cool things about M is that you don't actually need to learn the language, right? Because everything is done through the user interface. So for the most part, it's kind of an optional step. Uh, having said that, if you learn it, you can do more cool things. So really take it as, as you know, it's a, it's a nice to learn, but not a necessary to learn. I mean, I hope that sort of, you know, helps. Uh, it's, I feel the same way about SQL. You know, I mean, I know enough SQL to be really, really dangerous. It's really, really useful in certain scenarios. Uh, I end up actually sitting down and writing a SQL statement about once a year. Um, but when I'm doing it, it's really, really useful. Uh, VBA, I can reach into a lot easier because I got a lot of history working with that. And there are times when that is exactly what I need. So the more tools you learn, the more you realize that not everything is a hammer, right? And that's the thing. I, you know, I would say learn Power Query, not necessarily M. Learn where to use that instead of doing things in DAX. Uh, reshape your data, make your DAX life easier. But it, it's, you know, everything's important. But M is, uh, here, let me see. Let me put it this way. If I were going to, to recommend someone a path to learn, or um, if you actually follow the way that I set up my trainings for something like the self-service BI bootcamp, we learn, uh, we learn about pivot tables first so that we understand how those things actually work. We then learn about Power Query to reshape data. We learn about dimensional modeling to see how your data needs to be shaped for a dimensional model. Then we learn about DAX. Then we learn about how to actually build uh, visualizations and things inside Power BI. Uh, you'll notice that in there, I never said we learn M because we generally just don't need to. Uh, if you go into the Power Query Academy, M is near the end. So there's a lot more that uh, that actually goes on uh, along the way um, in those things. But, you know, as I say, there is nothing that you can learn that you shouldn't learn. So it just helps more in the grand scheme of things. So I'm really good at long-winded answers to these kind of questions. So it's because everything depends, right? So. Uh, any other questions that anybody has? I should ask a girl. I don't know how long you want to stay on the line because I mean I'm happy to talk about Excel for ages. So. 
Okay, uh, I think uh, time is uh, ending. Uh, actually, we have uh, five minutes for uh, taking it an opportunity. I would like to thank you again for accepting my invitation. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's very kind of you. And I strongly believe that one day we'll see each other in Baku and you deliver this kind of uh, presentation in our lovely city. So yeah. the last- I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking forward to that day, Elgar. I, I, I really do want to make it out to Baku and, uh, and it's a shame that the stuff all came in between and everything else, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to being on your soil and being able to do something like this. So can't wait. I strongly believe that in next year it will happen. And I'm trying uh, for this. So last thing I would like to ask everybody if they don't mind to turn on uh, their cameras just to take one picture and that's all. So we can leave the session. So be so kind as to turn off your computer, please. I mean, camera, please. So, okay. Uh-huh, that's all. Okay. So I took my picture. So thank you once again for your attendance. I appreciate your attendance and uh, I hope and strongly believe that uh, join to my next session, uh, which is going to happen on August 12th. So if you have, if you don't have anything, so I can say goodbye to you. So see you next time. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for the questions, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Right. Bye.